It's often been said that the secret to a great brand is great people. The CEO of Britain's biggest commercial insurance broker, Simply Business, is Jason Stockwood. And he knows a thing or two about what it takes to build a brilliant team. The company has been voted twice as the Sunday Times best company to work for. And this CEO believes that the big issue facing business is simply put, the way we work. Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has estimated, Jason, that there'll be uh, 15 million jobs going over the next 13 mm. years or so. It's a great day for the disruptors and the robots, mm. but probably a bad day for people. Well, I think there's a, there's a paradox in the data and the information that's coming out, Michael. So, you know, you think about you know, the wave of disruption, the pace of change is clearly accelerating. And yet every time we've had these industrial shifts in technologies, we've caught up with it at some mm. pace. So I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optimist about technology. But if you're a lorry yeah, driver, if yeah. you're working on a oil rig, if you're thinking about a long-term future as an Uber driver, yeah. these are bad days, right? Definitely. I think the long-term prognosis is definitely good for us. I think there's a world of abundance through technology that we're going to enter. But I think the short-term difficulty of the next 10, 20 years, as we navigate what Peter Diamandis calls the bridge to that world of abundance, I think it's the next 20 years where we need good government intervention. But right now, you've got a lot of entrepreneurs that are being held to account by slightly angry customers. Travis Kalanick in the back of one of his Uber cabs having a driver saying, you're sending me bankrupt. Yeah, well, I think this is the disparity between some of the sort of Silicon Valley views of, you know, focusing on wealth creation as the only motivation or signal of success, when actually we believe clearly that business is a part of a functioning, well-functioning society and shouldn't be seen as something abstracted from that. So I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an obligation of CEOs and entrepreneurs to create the right types of businesses that are part of society as well. So US Department of Labor is mm -hmm. estimating that two thirds of primary school kids will have jobs that don't even have a job title yet. I mean, is that the other side of this, is that we're all no. going to be doing things we never even thought possible? Well, I think undoubtedly, if I think about my 20s, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't set my career on hoping that, you know, the internet would be invent, invented and I'd create a career in there. So undoubtedly, there'll be a jobs that we're not thinking well, What today. did you think you were going to do? I mean, what were you going to do when you were a grown-up? What, what, what do you think about? That's the, that's the wrong question. I had no plan, Michael. So I, was just, I just followed my interests. I was inquisitive. I studied philosophy. So I was just looking for interesting things to get to be involved in. I still today, actually. So I was fortunate that I happened to land into a time and space when the internet was around. It was fascinating, so I got amongst it. But I had no idea it was going to be the sort of the success it was. And what about, you know, you look at like the next generation, your kids. What, what, are they, what do you think they're going to be doing? I mean, is, are you and other entrepreneurs creating the conditions that they're going to inherit. So th this is again a paradox that you'll hear and you'll read a lot about is that I don't allow my kids on technology. So my kids are eight and five and very sparingly now because of the pressure from school. I think that what we need our kids to be is free thinkers, but, collaborators. But you're a tech entrepreneur. So I, your kids, don't, you, you don't want them to use tech? No, I want them to, in the early stages of their life to develop the life skills required. Right. Technology has to be a servant of business means or customer needs. It can't be the driver. Creating technology for its sake is not the objective. It's got to make the world and it's got to make life better for us and for our consumers. Do you, do you think that tech has liberated us or do you think it's a bit of a jailer? Do you get this sense yeah. that actually, you know, the, the brave dream of technology that it was going to give easier lives yeah. is no longer the case? Well, I think that's, again, the paradox is we've become slaves to it. I think we'll look back 20 years from now on our addiction to mobile telephony as an example in the same way we look at TV ads for cigarette smoking in the 60s of kids advertising yeah. cigarettes. I think we're going to look back at this time as a form of obsession and neurosis that we'll frankly be embarrassed about, which is why for my kids, I want them to develop the skills as good human beings first. And the technology stuff will be part of their lives, but it shouldn't be the driving force in their lives. Right. So presumably, you are also an enthusiast about what yep. tech will do for us in terms of the future jobs that will be created. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what can we expect next? So I think there's a couple of things I'm seeing at the moment. So the pace of change is accelerating. So um, I was in LA recently looking at some startups and I saw things in quantum computing, which is around the corner, which is going to yeah. look, the pace of computing that we're seeing today is going to be blown to smithereens. I think you look at the pervasive... So this is the singularity, right? Well, so, Nirvana's so, coming. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. less enthused about that, but I do, th I do think what we'll see is quantum computing and the realisation of that will um, aid the pace of change, accelerate away in ways that make the internet look sluggish today, quite frankly. I think you look at the internet of things, pervasive sensors, and you look in a layer of machine learning in there, and there are all kinds of opportunities right. that could be used as a force for good for society in the round, rather than just a, a capital or wealth creation for a few entrepreneurs. So for us mere mortals in this age of the robots, what do we have to do to get ready? What does that future world of work look like 
if you're the man or the woman on the street that are thinking about their future jobs? So, so I came from a background where I did a number of mean, I was a waiter, I was a bar staff, I was a labourer on the docks. None of those jobs really appear that high on the top of Maslow's pyramid of self actualization Those jobs need to go, quite frankly. And I think what this promise of technology should be is it liberates, let the robots do the automated right. remote tasks. But, and let us be creative, let us be imaginative. Right, but, but if you're, if you're a, a PA who's sort of looking at Alexa and all these other sort of automated yeah. assistants, I mean, it's okay for people at the top of that hierarchy to be thinking about, we don't need these jobs anymore. But if you've got that job, you might feel very threatened right but now. But I have an optimistic view of human nature. I think, you know, from a, a working class background in Grimsby, the expectation of where I've got to, if I can do it, anybody can. You need the conditions of success, which is largely government obligation, set up educational opportunities and create that sort of freedom for people to move up through the classes. But, do you understand... but then it's about self-determination right. as well. But do you understand that there's a lot of people that feel that they're almost a hostage to this debate, that their jobs, their futures are being created by yeah. people like you and there is yeah. a responsibility right, yeah. on you and other entrepreneurs about those jobs of the future. But I take that obligation seriously. So for us, as an example, we have a contact centre where we have 200 people and we've committed that we're going to automate and use technology to take away the rote and quite frankly the quite boring elements of their job. But our promise to that team is that we're going to share that shareholder benefit between shareholders and reduce their working hours to a four day week by 2020 on the same wages. On the same that's wages. The, that's the type of strategy right. we need to share the benefit between shareholders and, and the employees and parts of the organisation. And when you look back, say over the last four years. I mean, are your people doing a lot of things that they never dreamt they would be doing right now? I mean, to what degree is that disruption a here and now issue? Yeah, I think I think the automation of processes, I think we've also seen that the machine learning algorithms that are open source now and allowing us to think of uses of data in ways that we can't of today. But, you know, the, the future often feels closer than it is. And I think, you know, when I think of the last 20 years, where, you know, we, we go short on terms of, you know, the, 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 the negativities and yet actually we're long on the optimism. I think I think we need to bring those things closer together. I think the future is potentially abundant for us, but at the same time, we've got an obligation to educate people and, and navigate those rivers to take us. Right, there. so you've had almost like what Leicester City will probably never now have, which is two premiership wins. You've, had, you've been the Sunday Times best company to work for two years running. Um, I mean, that's quite applauded. I mean, what's... Yeah. What, what what do people see in Simply Business? Yeah. What do people I'm stuck on the Claudio, going on? I'm Claudio uh, Ranieri analogy now, Michael. I'm going to end up in a resume, couple of weeks. Exactly. Yeah, no. Hopefully the shareholders won't be watching this. I think the starting point for us is that every business, whether they like it or not, is a technology and data business. And I think that's wrapped around phenomenal cultures. You need great people to win. And I think for us, we start with that principle, which is we're trying to solve a problem for customers, but the culture that drives that has to be right. Right. So if we haven't got a great culture internally where people feel empowered, trusted, and have the ability to choose what they work on. Our customers can never be served well. So I think it's actually, it, it makes good sense from the type of culture you're trying to build, but it also makes good business sense. People work hard when they feel engaged in your right. business. So for me, it's, it's an obvious thing to do, is try and build a culture that empowers people. And are you planning for a business that will have more in the way of AI and robots and less people? Yeah. Or do you actually have more people in there as well? Well, we're growing and I think those things can live side by side. So three new roles, to your point earlier around new roles, where um, we're hiring a head of automation and AI. We're hiring a life coach so our employees can feel like the strategic goals of the business are mapped to their own personal goals. And, you know, we're, we're hiring a behavioural economist at the moment as well to think about how we can think about human behaviour and how that interacts with technology and our customers. And again, these are both examples of how we want to automate and think progressively about our business. These are also roles that wouldn't have existed 10 yeah. years ago. So I think they're good examples of both. So, I mean, a, a lot of the debate is mm -hmm. about jobs going, but of course, a lot of businesses like yours that are in the kind of London area mm -hmm. especially are actually dealing with a skills drought right now. I mean, how, how do you find good people? Yeah, well, I think our, you know, Focusing on culture helps, it attracts people. I think we've got a, a growth business that's trying to solve a problem in a market where customers are underserved as well. And we're ambitious and you know, we try and hire great people, technical skills are given, and just trust them to try and be the best they can. And can you but, find enough of them here? I mean, are you worried about things like Brexit and other sorts of things in terms of your yeah. ability to hire great people? So in our London office, we have nearly 180 people and we've got 30 different nationalities. So I'm vastly concerned around, you know, if there's a restriction on talent coming from, certainly from the EU, 
Um, and it is a struggle, you know, we're, we're trying to add this another 50 people at the moment. And so it, you can add people, but adding quality is difficult. And I think if we shut down or create higher barriers to entry for the UK, that's going to become even more difficult. And if you look at the future in terms of the sort of people that you're going to mm. need, mm. can you find enough of them here in the UK? At the moment, yes. I mean, again, there is a, there's a, you know, there's an educated and willing and bright and talented workforce in the UK. But I'd be worried about, you know, we, we need that access to international markets as well. Not only just to be able to make the best talent, but for diversity in your organisation as well, which is a massive driver of success at the same time. And in terms of growing your business in this climate, when you look at the future, mm. you look at that kind of future business you're yeah. building, are you, are you optimistic about what you can do here? Yeah, I'm an optimist by nature, I'm an entrepreneur, which is <laughs> yeah, very, so. I, think, I think so. And I think, you know, the UK is growing, it's becoming increasingly digitised. In our sector, which is a laggard in the insurance industry, there's a huge opportunity for digitisation. Mm. And I think also, we just launched in the US three months ago, and we're looking at the international markets. So there's no, there's no, there's no doubt there's a lot of opportunities for growth. And how does a market like the US grab you in terms of a lot of British companies have gone over there and yeah. we've never heard of them again? Um, <laughs> what's going to make you different? I've been your cloudy every near analogy here. So I've been in, no, but, I, I, I think... Well, that, even M&S gave up, right? Well, I think that it's an underserved market. We're not, we're not in any way um, naive to the challenges in that market, but it has to be true that... In our market, digitization and uh, focus on the customer doesn't exist in our product ranges. So customers need that. And I think we've got we've got a, a blueprint from the UK that gives us a good chance of success. And we'll test our way into it, quite frankly. We've got a methodology and an appetite to, to try and find the truth in small increments rather than a big bang approach. So we're optimistic and we're bullish about it. And it's a reason for taking it on. The fact that so many people have failed is another reason for having a go at it, quite right. frankly. Right. And when you look at your own life, Match.com, all the other sort of disruptors mm. that you've you've worked with, yeah. what does that teach you about the Jason that you've come to know today? Um, I, I was, I've always felt this. I always felt there's more ahead of me than there is behind me. I think that's the way that we think about opportunities and inquisitiveness. So for me, you know, I'm, I'm constantly learning. I'm excited about the opportunities in the future. I think it's retaining that motivation and excitement around things you don't know rather than the things you do know. And the, and, and the truism is, you, know, you just need to surround yourself with great people. The, I've got a couple of people with me. They make me want to be better at my job. So hiring people that make you want to improve is the absolute critical key to success, I think. Right. And there is, though this issue that talented people like yourself, talented people like presumably the people that work at Simply Business have got a lot to play for in this economy. Yep. If you're part of the have nots yeah. in this environment, if you're people that sort of feel a bit left out by the yeah. conversation we're having, what's your message to them? So I think business is a force for good. So our, our overall ethos in Simply Business, as it is with a lot of other businesses that are going for B Corp accreditation, is that you know business is not isolated from its effect on both its employees, its customers, and society and the environment as well. And we take all of those obligations seriously. Right. And there's an but, increasing number of businesses that think like that. But what can they practically do? I mean, you say business is a force for good, mm. but if you, if you believe the surveys, a lot of people... Yeah would feel exactly the opposite about business right now, that it yeah. isn't a force for good, that it's actually about job cutting, not yeah, job so, creating. So, yeah, sorry, Mike. Not, not all businesses, but I think there's a growing cohort of businesses that see their obligation, not just to shareholders. It's creating jobs. It's doing the right thing by the environment. And it's thinking about business as a, as a proactive member of society rather than just something which is a wealth creation and a concentration of capital. I think what you're alluding to is this, this distinction we're seeing today, which is you know capital being further apart from labor in terms of where the value is created. And I think businesses like ours try to bring them close together and say, we do take obligations to shareholders seriously, but the way you do that is taking care of people and taking care of the environment and society at large as well. And I'm hopeful that that's the movement we'll see over the next 10 years as people realise that you know money in isolation is not a good motivation for people. The march of business, the march of jobs. Jason, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Michael. Well, what did I learn there? Well, the future is not just going to be about machines. There are going to be a lot of new jobs. And it's because of that that people will continue to be the secret source of many great businesses. So business could have a new mission in creating the very future of work.